So uh, without much further ado, Mr. David Duffett's going to let us know why nerds aren't heard. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? Well, good. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for assembling first thing in the morning. Um, as you know, I used to work with uh, Digium and then Sangoma as the Worldwide Community Director for the Asterisk Project. Uh, but, you know, uh, but Sangoma uh, have helped me have more time now to focus on this. Uh, because I'm no longer working with them, and so I've moved on to a project called Why Nerds Aren't Heard, because having been involved in technical uh, conferences, training and presentations for some years, I came to the conclusions that nerds were getting a raw deal in life, and I wanted to help them out. And so here is the agenda for our short time this morning. I want, want to identify the problem first, as I see it. Then I want to talk about why nerds need to be heard, then I'm going to go through briefly seven ways that geeks sabotage their own presentations. And uh, I've also got some protocols that I've boiled things down to to try and help. How does that sound? Is that okay? Yep. Good. All right. Uh, by the way, I have got a participant. But nerds were getting a raw me. deal in life. In the form of small chocolate bars. So if you ask any questions or answer any questions, you stand uh, a high chance of getting some chocolate this morning. Okay. So the problem. Geeks. Geeks are fine. They get to wear trendy T-shirts. That particular one says it's hard to read, but it says, I'm not slacking off. My code's compiling. Uh, there are lots of other T-shirts. You know, the one about there is one zero kinds of people, the people that understand binary and all that. You get to wear all the great T-shirts, but geeks get put in the corner of the office. People don't always talk to them. They have to go and buy their own lunch. And yet, round the corner, the salesman... <laughs> Now, I, I realise that Ron Burgundy is not a salesman, but, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll take my meaning. They're out there with their luxury company cars, their expense accounts, all of that kind of stuff. And, and having worked in a lot of companies and seen this a number of times over, I got to thinking, well, hang on a minute. Who makes and supports this stuff? It's the geeks, isn't it? And so I came to a conclusion that geeks need to be helped because the problem is that technical people are not looked after in the same way as the salespeople or the marketing people. In other words, they're not paid the same. They're not recognised the same, and they're not rewarded the same. Now, I'm not suggesting salespeople should be paid less, because I respect all of the skills that they have. However, what I am suggesting is geeks need to be looked after better. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Geeks definitely need to be looked after better. So, uh, what I want to do is help geeks to be more... And if you are more, you can do more. And if you do more, you can have more in terms of success. Whatever your definition of that emotive word success might be. Okay, okay, okay. So, this conference, by, by the way, don't think that I'm here casting my eye over everybody's presentation and critiquing it, because technical conferences are different. When a technical person gets up at a technical conference, they instantly have credibility. Like when Lorenzo got up yesterday, he's the Janus guy, isn't he? Everybody knows he's the Janus guy. There's credibility. When Sal got up, he's the Jitsi guy. So there's instantly credibility there. And technical people have cred credibility with other technical people. However, however, there are other audiences out there other than the technical audience. And the chances are that at some stage, you're going to have to make a presentation to a less technical audience. Now, it could be to get a job. A lot of job interviews these days include presentations. It could be sharing with your non-technical colleagues about what you do in the company in order to help sort of intercompany working. Or it could be sales presentations. There's a few different things. And what about the big one, attracting funding or selling your company or something? These can be very big presentations for people, and they are usually to less technical audiences. Now, let me just ask a quick, quick question. Has anybody ever seen a really, really good presentation? Oh, that's a, that's a good start. About 30% of the people. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give that man a chocolate for having seen a, a good presentation. Has anybody seen a really, really terrible presentation? Exactly. I see it. Andrew has seen a really terrible presentation. Yeah, I'm going to have to get better at throwing things around slightly. Now, the thing is... Can you imagine if we asked an audience of HR professionals if they'd ever seen a good presentation or a bad presentation? They'd put their hands up as well. But when you asked them why, can you imagine the answer would be somewhat different to a, uh, a technical group like this? In other words, 
people have different criteria for judging presentations. Excuse me for one moment. And this is where I want to help. You see, geeks that can speak to non-technical audiences do reap a number of rewards. They are more successful in various areas of life, whether it's getting that pay rise, whether it's getting that promotion. And it's no, it's no accident I've put a picture of a nice looking young lady there either. Because geeks that can speak have more advantages in various areas of life. And so, thinking about how I could help, because you can see I'm getting a little bit of grey hair now, how I could give back to the community, I thought what I would like to do is help geeks communicate, present a little bit better. I thought if I could do that, then I can help geeks to be a bit more successful. And so I've started writing a book. It's only halfway done. It's called Let the Geek Speak, because I want nerds to be heard, and I want to help propel ahead. Propel ahead. That's the key here. And uh, I've, what I've done is I've boiled this down to protocols, because when thinking about you know the seven habits of highly effective people or the five pillars of building wealth, I was sat with a friend of mine. I said, what's a really good word, beginning with a P, hopefully, that you know, encapsulates rules or ways of doing things? And my friend sat across the table from me, and after about 10 seconds, he said, protocols. And I said, you're exactly right. Protocols would be the ideal uh, descriptor for these things, because as geeks, we're used to following protocols in one way or another. Sometimes we're actually even working within protocols, aren't we, like SIP and stuff like that. So I've defined seven protocols for a great presentation. And if you follow the protocols, and of course I'm going to put up seven words here, however in the book each of those words has a chapter of its own that goes through what to do in those protocols. If you follow those seven protocols, then your presentations will inevitably be, be better. The first one is the purpose of the presentation. You see, here's what I've noticed. Somebody asks a geek to do a presentation, and the very first thing they do is open Keynote or PowerPoint and start hacking on some slides. They don't necessarily would. Now, what I'm saying is, uh, if you're somebody that doesn't read the manual, you might deliver a presentation in a kind of action-orientated way. But imagine if most people in your audience are the kind of people that do read the manual, that would be the wrong thing for them. So you understand what I'm talking about in preparation is not only thinking about the content, but thinking about the way you deliver things, even preparation like going to visit the room you might be delivering the presentation in. There's all sorts of dimensions to preparation. Then there's practice. I know this is not in vogue with geeks, uh, but practicing a presentation is always a good investment of time. Participation is also key. Getting interaction, going with the audience and engagement, very important. Uh, then your performance, delivering the presentation. And in there I talk about dealing with nerves and things like that. And then lastly, post-event. A lot of geeks show up, do the presentation, ship out, never think about it again. But actually, it's part of an ecosystem. And there's all sorts of things to think about after the presentation as well. So those are the protocols that I've boiled it down to. And they are what the book is about. Seven power presenting protocols for nerds. But let's have a look at this concept I've called GPS. Geek Presentation Sabotage. This is where geeks, deliberately or not, somehow manage to destroy, damage, or obstruct, otherwise, their own presentations. And here's the first way, by way too much focusing on the technical content. Now, that's fine for a technical conference, but when you're talking to a non-technical audience, it's going to bore them, isn't it, frankly? And let me just share a secret with you. People really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them. So really, you've got to spend time at the beginning of the audience just loving them, as the Americans would say, loving on them, I know that doesn't sound right, but that's what the Americans say. Uh, loving on them, in, you know, in order to let them know that you care about them and you want to do the right thing for them. And then you can talk to them, but remember, just don't give them too much technical information. Your audience are all tuned into that one station. It's called WIIFM, or What's In It For Me. And they're not thinking, they're not sat there thinking, I wonder how much this geek knows. I want him to just spill his technical stuff with me. No, they want you to answer the questions that they've got in their mind about, is this product good for me? Is it going to make a difference in my life? And so my little idea for you to take away would be, and I'm afraid it's right at the bottom, and I'm aware some people at the back can't see the very bottom, so I'll just read out that point. My takeaway idea on this point is, come up at least one technical level from what you were thinking. 
to give you an example, if you were thinking about displaying lines of code, maybe come up to a block diagram or something like that. Because at the end of the day, you're going to bring more people with you if you come up a level. And those that have got the technical questions can ask you, and you can tell them the answers, can't you? Either in the presentation or after it. But there's, it's going to do no harm to just simplify things one level uh, in order to help the presentation along. So, what's next? No proper planning. You know the FBI six Ps? Proper planning prevents particularly poor performance. That is the clean version, by the way. There's a slightly ruder version than that. You've got to get on with your planning, and you've got to uh, make conscious decisions about every part of your presentation. Um, not only the content, as I was saying, and the structure, but the keys to memory as well. Sadly, a lot of geeks think that the cool thing to do is to do their presentation on the aeroplane over, or the night before, or maybe the hour before, or maybe the ten minutes before. And yeah, <laughs> oh, Alex is just settling down to do his. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're going to do that, sometimes it will work, but other times it might not. You might be missing key bits of information and all of a sudden your internet's gone down or, or you might have a slow internet connection. There's all sorts of things that can happen. So, must involve yourself in good planning. Yeah, again, uh, lastminute.com. Can you imagine this? I know this is hard for you all to imagine, but just imagine... You had to go to court for a very serious charge. You'd been accused of something. I'm not going to say exactly what it is, but you weren't guilty, okay? However, you'd ended up in court somehow. Imagine when you went to see your legal uh, defence, your attorney, your barrister or whatever, and you said, right, you know, when are we going to get down to the preparation for the case? And he went, actually, I don't really get into preparation. I like to just wing it. You know, my best cases are the ones when I just show up and do my best. You know, you, all that usually works. <laughs> Yeah, would, would you have, who, who laughed, by the way? I want to give a chocolate to a person that laughed. Somebody right at the back. Was it Dan Christian Bogos? Hold on. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can make it there. I'll apologise if I hit somebody. <laughs> oh. Sorry, can you get that done? Yeah. Listen, our insurance only covers beach balls, man. Yeah, I, I realise I if there's Americans in the audience, they're a very litigious bunch. And I just want to be held harmless from any chocolate-related injuries. Um... Whoops, where did we get to? Yes, so, yeah, uh, yeah, make sure you do your preparation. There are many, many di uh, dimensions to it. Here's the idea to take away. Walk in your customer's shoes. Actually spend some time thinking about when, my, when people come to my presentation, what are they going to see, what are they going to feel, what are they going to hear? And I'm, I'm talking about every single dimension you can think of. Imagine if they couldn't even find your presentation in the first place. That wouldn't be very good, would it? So preparation in all of these things. And, and actually, it reminds me of a, a saying I once heard, and that is, if you're going to criticise somebody, walk a mile in their shoes first. Because then, when you do criticise them, you'll be a mile away and have their shoes. <laughs> Useful information. OK. <clears throat> Beta trialling. This is the whole art of practising. Amateurs practise until they get it right, but professionals will practise something until they can't get it wrong. It's absolutely key. And if you're somebody that suffers with nerves in a presentation, probably the time when your nerves are highest are at the beginning of the presentation. So a good place to practice is the very beginning. Practice the first few minutes. Go over it again and again and again and again so you get to a place where you can be on autopilot as you zoom in to a presentation and your nerves settle and then you fly off to another amazing success successful presentation where you rock it and there's a standing ovation at the end and everybody goes wild. Because that's the sort of presentations we do as geeks, isn't it? We get people enthusiastic and excited. So geeks are happy. You, you would never let software out without proper beta trialling, would you? Would you? No, <laughs> indeed. So why do people do that with presentations? Why is it they don't practice them? I would submit to you that you've got to practice. And when I say practice, here's what practicing is not. Practicing is not in your hotel room the hour before the presentation, looking at the slide and thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll say that on that slide. And yeah, I'll say that on that. That's not practicing. Practicing is out loud. To an audience, maybe your colleagues at work, if they're available. If they're not, friends or family. If not, what about practicing into your mobile phone to record it? And then you can play it back and see how you sound. The reason for this is manyfold. Number one, gives you an idea of timings and how that's going to work out. But number two, what about phrases that you might trip over? 
What about words that don't sound quite right? What about concepts that sound good in your head, but then when you try to explain them out loud, they don't quite sound quite so good? You really need to practice out loud. So that's the takeaway tip, is make sure you alpha trial and beta trial your presentations. Practice them out loud. Now, what about geeks that rush in and leave out a certain key element? Who do you think I'm talking about? Who do you think gets left out sometimes in presentations? Take a guess. You'll get a chocolate whether you get it right or wrong. The audience. Flipping it. He, he's perfectly correct, isn't he? And just to prove it, have I ever met you before, Alex? Who are you? <laughs> just to prove it, look. The audience. And by the way, do you see what I did there? There was a little bit of participation in there, wasn't there? About the audience. That's right. Participation is absolutely crucial for engagement. You've got to get involved in participation because... People, we, we don't like having things done to us, do we? But we do like having things done with us, or maybe even sometimes done for us. But participation is all about doing things with people. Involvement equals commitment. The more that you can involve people, the more they're going to be committed to your outcomes. And it can take many forms. It's not just questions. Questions are great. In fact, there's a, there's a whole book written about questions called Questions of the Answer. It's a fantastic book it's from a, a guy that talked about body language. But questions are excellent, especially when combined with good eye contact. Because if you don't use good eye contact, people don't think you're talking to them. But if you do use good eye contact, people think you are talking to them. And then when you ask a question, they will give an answer in their mind. Did you know that all questions are always answered? Always. Whether people verbalise the answer to not or, or not, they're always answered. So... No, I'll have to tell you, it's, I am sold myself. You know, if you're going to give an enthusiastic presentation, it's got to be something that you believe in. It's no good if you've been kind of pushed out onto stage or pushed out to talk about something you don't really want to talk about. And by the way, if you've got a boss that wants to ask you to do a presentation every now and again, that's great, because it's a great opportunity doing a presentation. However, never be frightened to push back on that boss, especially if time is precious. Say, OK, what is it you're going to, you know let go of in terms of a priority for me to have the right amount of time to prepare for this presentation. Because pre presentations do need preparation. I would suggest if you're creating an hour-long presentation, you need at least eight hours to prepare it. Eight to one is probably the smallest ratio. So you need uh, preparation time. And the trouble is, if you're out in front of an audience doing a presentation, it doesn't matter whether it's not your fault or whether the boss made you or whether the AV doesn't work because it's a technician's fault. The guy that looks like a monkey is going to be you, isn't it? Or me, in this particular case. And so it's very important to get everything right around this. Attitudes are definitely catching. And you've got to deal with your, no your nerves because uneasy makes for uneasy. If you're an uneasy presenter, that transmits onto the audience and they get a little bit uh, uneasy. Well, Whereas, if you're a presenter that wants to have fun, then the audience will catch that and they will have fun too. And one of, in the performance protocol, I deal with nerves. There's nothing actually wrong with nerves, and there's a lot you can do to minimise them. You might never get rid of them altogether, but the way I look at that is if you're going to have butterflies, get your butterflies to fly in formation and make a super presentation. And the takeaway tip here would be check yourself actually ask yourself, do I want to do this presentation in the first place? If I don't, should I get a colleague to do a presentation that may do a better job because they're more bought in to what the concept is? Or am I really enthusiastic about this? And just when I nipped over there, pitch, pace and pauses, I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of what we might call a monotonous presentation, clues in the word, monotonous, monotone, when people just go and, you know, a bit like air traffic controllers doing that. You know, those sort of presentations are a little bit difficult to grab hold of sometimes. OK, and our last one, the failure to follow up. As I mentioned, a presentation is part of a kind of an ecosystem. It doesn't stand by itself. There was a reason it was done in the first place, and we need to check up on how that presentation was received. Number one, by immediate feedback from the participants. So we might have a feedback sheet or an online form or a show of hands, or we might go through the objectives at the end of the presentation to make sure that everybody feels they've been achieved. But in the, in the broader scheme of things, was the overall learning achieved? So in other words, if your presentation was to train in a new working practice, you're going to go back to the guy that asked you to do that in a couple of months and say, right, are people now doing that new working practice? Or did they go to the training 
and then just go back to doing things the way they did in the first place, because that would not be useful. Um, and this uh, really is also a good time to talk about the timing of training or a presentation. When you're asked to deliver a presentation, a good question to ask is, is now the right time to do it? Obviously, if it's part of a conference, that's a you know question is irrelevant. But if it's like a work presentation about some new product or something like that, a real good question to ask is, is this the right time to do the presentation? And you could ask the guy, is this, you know, is this the right time? And they'll go, actually, no. Now you come to think about it. OK, so I would like to summarise. But before I do, people may have questions. And so, Alex, I have a small picture of you on the screen okay. indicating that you might like to answer to uh, handle questions for a while. But once Alex is finished, we'll come back to me and I'll finish the presentation with a summary. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> David's caught me a little off guard. He's decided to change the format with an executive decision. So, as David asked, Question. We are open for question. Okay, so okay gentleman in the back with the glasses there. Um, right? He back. was the first man with his hand up. You're a really inquiring person. Always. I have two questions for you. Yes, sir. Go ahead with the presentation. Let's do a question. First one is how many times did you get practice at that presentation? That's a good question. Do you want the honest answer? Yes. Twice. Um, is that all? Yes. I, I would usually do more, but however, done all the bits I, I don't want to go into the circumstances of preventing this, but yes. But let me, let, me, let me give you a better answer. I once went for a job that I really, really wanted, and I knew a presentation was part of it. I practiced that bad boy 15, 20 times. And uh, I even emailed the company and said, can you send me a room layout of the room I'm going to be presenting into this job interview? And I just kind of went to town. Yeah, practice, yeah, in the key job. Yeah, I did get the job as well. Okay. And the second question was in a multicultural environment. Yeah. What pointers would you like to recommend? That's a good and one, and I'll take an example. I, I, and maybe it's an issue if you've got an audience and it's got half German and half French. Mm. How do you deal with them? I wouldn't <laughs> want to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to have a word with my boss. Actually, I'll give you one. Yeah, I'll give you one quick cultural thing I came across. I was in Malaysia doing a presentation. I was throwing chocolates as I like to do. I learned that throwing chocolates overarm is actually offensive because you're throwing at people. But throwing it underarm is very acceptable because you're throwing it to people. So that's a learning point. Having said that, I think I've established enough rapport at the beginning that people knew that I wasn't deliberately being offensive or nasty. Um, the cultural thing, I suppose you've got to take it um, kind of as it comes. And unless you know the cultural background and the things that you do do and you don't do uh, with those audiences, for instance, just a stereotypical thing, Germans are much more likely to want to cut to the chase, aren't they, and get to it. You're saying no. Okay, maybe we'll experience a different bunch of Germans. <laughs> okay, but yeah, you've really got to dig in and find out. Really. <coughs> An example I've got is Japan. I love a little bit of interaction, as you know. When you're doing a presentation in Japan, you don't expect any interaction. People don't like to get involved. In fact, it, apparently, it's a sign of weakness to ask a question in front of the other people in the audience. Um, I kind of sidestep your question. I don't feel I've given you a great, or great answer. Have you got an answer, sir? Do you ask a question? Um, there's a microphone. There's Alex behind you, holding the microphone. I'm working on it. Ah, OK. Just shout them. I, I don't have a perfect answer. Really, it comes down to yeah, cultural sensibility. And, and you get into a country where you have no idea of what the culture is a challenge. Mm. And you face an audience which has come from multiple different challenges of cultures, is also a challenge. Very, very much so. Very, very much so. <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, simultaneous translation sounds exciting, but it's also a big challenge the spontaneity of the presentation. Who was our next questioner? Over oh, there. Oh, sorry. Let's go that one first. Okay, sir. Scream it out. When you explained about seven protocols, yes. Yes. There was a very simple 
Ah, I'm going to give you two chocolates. That is coming up when I summarise. Well done, then. Who was on it from over here? For the question. Yes, sir. Have to be comedy. Actually, one, one very big message I would give is be true to yourself. That comes out in the performance approach, not in the book. Because if you see somebody do a joke and you think that's a great joke, I'm going to do it, and it doesn't fit in with you, then it's not going to be very good. So being true to yourself is very, very important. I would say that any presentation that edu that entertains in addition to doing the other job will be more memorable. Um, I'll give you a quick example. I was teaching a presentation skills class, and one of the guys on it was a health and safety manager, okay? Not given to be a town person, to be very kind of, you know, follow the process, follow the procedure. But he started, I, I encouraged people to try and find a really clever way of starting their presentation, something that can have a bit of impact. May I sit on your desk for a moment, Lorenzo? So he started his presentation by sitting on the desk, and he said, uh, would anybody like the afternoon off today? And, you know, he that's a very, very good question. And that's part of the tale, depending on where you are. Because some people give away more than others. Uh, I would say if, if I was in front of an English audience that I fully understood, I could probably get something back, you know, in seconds. Whereas in other audiences... This is part of our job, by the way, as presenters. We're going to come back to that word rapport in a moment. Um, that's part of our job as a presenter, is to open up that communications channel to receive the feedback. Okay, time for a couple more questions before we... Oh, oh sorry. Before I'm back started. to tell you that we don't have any more time no, we for don't questions. Have no, I've just got to finish. Okay, very... <laughs> That's why I'm sending you back to the pulpit. Very quick. Okay, sorry. So, has this ever happened to you? You're trying to watch a YouTube video and it buffers. Okay, that's because you haven't got the bandwidth. And rapport, if we look at these protocols very quickly... Somebody did spot the word down the middle, which is rapport. Rapport is your bandwidth with the audience. The more rapport you've got, the wider your communication channel is. You, you know, you don't want a, a 10 meg ADSL. You want a 250 meg symmetrical or a 1 gig symmetrical fibre connection with people. And it needs to be two-way. It's not just for you to give information. It's for you to read the feedback as well. Okay, very last thing. This is the website at the moment. Let the geekspeak.com slash free report. If you go there, you can register and get your very own copy of this free report, as the name suggests. And are we having a raffle at the end of tomorrow? We are. Okay, I have. This is my one, but I've got a brand new one. A very trendy Let the Geek Speak coat. And we will, today. We will, yeah, we'll do a draw of everybody that uh, uh, hand over one of these tomorrow. It's been a pleasure telling you about why geeks need to speak. It's been a pleasure sharing the protocols with you, but I know the pleasure will be yours when you implement these and have more success as a geek that can speak. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Graffer.